Hello YouTube, this is Morgan, Airspeed Prime here with my next Sword Art Online light novel review. This one is going to be for uh, Sword Art Online Allization Invading, which is volume 15 of the light novels. And I suppose is the start of the second half of the Allization arc. Uh, as we, in the middle of this arc, begin the uh, War of the Underworld, which is pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, yeah, this is a very, very interesting arc because they finally go into a lot of detail about what exactly is going on in the Dark Territory. Given that we are setting up the war, the war is, at the end of this volume is just about to start. The first battle is basically just about to happen. We get established, basically... What is the makeup of the forces of the uh, uh, Dark Territory? At this point, we know that the uh, human forces are made up of basically the Integrity Knights and a handful of warriors. Uh, and that's the situation that we have because of the way that... Um, because of everything that happened basically in the first part of the arc of like the Integrity Knights have... All of the experience points basically that should have been spread out across all of the people, but instead they're... All, Basically, every uh, experience point is in the Integrity Knights. So they are the most powerful warriors in the game. But there is only 31 of them. And as they reveal in the middle of this volume, they pretty much only have access to about 24 of them. And even then, there's only about 7 uh, higher Integrity Knights who are the ones who actually have a divine weapon. And so have the ability to use all the um, release commands and stuff like that. Have the basically super special uh, versions of swords and so on. Um, but the big thing here is that I suppose we finally get the full details about what exactly is going on in the ocean turtle. What was this attack that we heard about last time out? What happened to Kirito in terms of what, what happened in, in real life? And what's going on? So we find out that basically the ocean turtle is under attack from a basically a paramilitary organization. It's not part of any government or anything like that. It's led by this guy whose name is Gabriel Miller who effectively becomes the main villain of this arc here. He wants to uh, steal Alice's light cube and um, he seems to have the trait of uh, preferring the reality of uh, virtual worlds over the actual um, real world so he of course would have an interest in the first I suppose bottom-up AI the first actual artificial human and he basically wants to have a kind of private VR world where he can just basically be in there full time and have just a select group of people in there. Uh, they haven't gone f fully in, in depth into, I suppose, the exact full motivations, but you get a good sense of his character early on in that, for one, it's revealed that he is Subtilizer, so the guy who's won a couple of the Bullet, the bullet tournaments in GGO is this guy Gabriel Miller. So he has military training, so that's why he's so good at GGO, and why he's equally as good when he goes into Underworld here. Uh, they establish some pretty kind of dark, creepy things about him in that he has a he has a very weird view on life and that I suppose that they basically say he doesn't like fear death and it's to such a degree where like he has no problem with killing people and that they basically say that like he killed his childhood friend just because something bad happened to her and he just killed her really brutally. Like what did they say? He he just sticks this like thin knife straight through her head. It's it's actually really brutal the way they describe it. Uh, so when that happens in the anime, that's going to be very, very shocking to see. There's some pretty crazy stuff going on. Um, and they, they note that, like, kind of setting up the whole psychopath thing of, like, yeah, he's he's killing insects just to, to watch what they do and stuff like that. And uh, that's what they... Where, where they go with this and basically say he sets up a paramilitary organization and attacks the ocean turtle. Uh, we also get uh, revealed here that he attacks with a guy named Visago, who they're basically saying is like a previous Laughing Coffin member um, without fully committing to the reveal just yet. Uh, I think that's kind of absolutely where they're heading. He's He talks in like VMMORPG kind of jargon the entire time. He says dot, d damage over time. Uh, mobs and is super casual and just talks about doing all of this to have some fun he doesn't take any of it seriously being part of an actual military organization or the fact that they're in this 
world where they're going to be effectively killing uh, you know artificial beings if they kill anyone he just thinks it's thinks that it's fun so there are two i suppose main villains introduced here and basically what happens is we get this situation where uh, Asuna and uh, everyone who's part of like the, the science group basically lock themselves in the top of the ocean turtle which is where the main kind of command center is and is also where the first I suppose um, soul translator room is so Kirito is um, safe for the most part like they have access to him it's not that like they downstairs have access to Kirito no they have him up there it's just that they cut the power and that's kind of what uh, you know hurt Kirito and led to him but I'll get into that in just a second uh the situation we have is that there's basically barriers like it's a really high tech um facility so they can't break through that easily so they're kind of stuck in the bottom but they still have access to some things and the main thing that happens here is that they get access to a couple of the soul translators and so what happens is that Gabriel Miller as well as Vazago decide to jump into the game and initially it seems like oh are we gonna have to start from like level one here but they decide that okay we don't have access down here to any high level accounts on the human side of things but we actually do have access because they have a hacker with them to the high level accounts on the dark territory side of things uh, so this is where we get introduced to i suppose the in-game villains of um emperor vecta who uh, is the that's the account that Gabriel Miller takes over. So Subtilizer is Emperor Vector, uh, Vecta. Uh, and then uh, Vazago takes over control of a very powerful uh, Dark Knight. So the Integrity Knight kind of counterpart is what Vazago is in, in this game. Uh, and, that, and the idea is that he is the Emperor. Um, Gabriel Miller is the Emperor of the Dark World. Um, the Dark Territory. And... We obviously, from there, basically cut into him doing what he needs to do because they basically say that to get Alice out, they can't just steal her light cube because it's in use in the game. So they have to, within the game, uh, basically capture her and do the, I suppose, official command of eject uh, light cube. Uh, So that's why they are required to go in there to get Alice out. And effectively what's going on here is that it is a war to get Alice effectively and um, Gabriel Miller of course has to keep up the I suppose lore of the world and act like the emperor of darkness even though it's just an account he's taken over um, but still accomplish his goals um, and then on the ocean turtle side of things they decide that we, we learn what happened to Kirito basically and, and we learn this in the present day story which I'll get into in a second with Alice and um, that Kirito is basically unconscious. Um, He's in a sort of like living coma type thing where he's basically unresponsive. He's still alive, his heart is beating, but he's effectively unresponsive. Like Alice can sort of force him to eat and she can get him to stand up but not move around and that's really about it. Uh, and you see that over the course of the this volume that he reacts to certain things. Like he always wants to... He makes sure that he always holds on to both his own black sword as well as um, Yu-Gi-Oh's broken sword. He he doesn't seem happy unless he has them. He doesn't talk ever, but it's just these kind of uh, basic instincts that he seems to have of make sure he has those swords. And then a few times, Alice begins to learn that even though he seems like he's gone and is effectively kind of useless, whenever something bad happens... It looks like he is trying as much as he can in the state that he's in to jump in and help. And so it it acts as this kind of really nice kind of character uh, growth kind of thing for Alice where she's obviously just learning to be a kind of free being now that she's no longer held back by the seal and she knows the truth about what's going on. But the fact is that she's not the... I suppose original Alice she's this kind of altered version of Alice who is Alice's synthesis 30 Um, and she basically learns here from Kirito to sort of uh, in a way like become the hero fulfill the role that he otherwise would and she's taken up this role of having to look after him outside in the ocean turtle uh, Higa is the one to explain to Asuna what has happened to Kirito so the explanation we get here is that when it happened, when the Kirito going unconscious happened in the game, he was at the console, 
And he basically is blaming himself and kind of almost like they basically describe it as because he blames himself, it's effectively him hurting his own fluctlight. And so because of the power surge that happens when the power is cut off because of the entry of Gabriel Miller, um, it basically makes that a reality. Like that that, that effect on his li- uh, fluctlight actually happens. And it basically creates this... Uh, they basically say it's this kind of rift within his fluctlight. It doesn't damage most of it, but there's just this kind of... Uh, there's damage to one specific part of it that uh, just means that he's effectively looks like he's in like a vegetative state type thing where he doesn't react all that much to stimuli or anything like that speak but he has he still has a certain amount of instincts and is still alive um so they basically set up the idea that because of that because there's still this like willingness for him to like in some way help out that we see through the Alice section of the story they have hope that now, in terms of Kirito's kind of uh, to heal him, it's gone from the Soul Translator machine healing Kirito by him using the game. Now, within the game, he actually has to make a connection with the people there to sort of bring him back online and fix that now damaged part of his fluctlight, and then the healing process can kind of begin again. And this is where they bring up the fact that. Asuna is now going to dive into the underworld. She makes up this. She makes this decision. They have a uh, a machine available for her to dive in on, and that's what we're going to do. We don't get too much in that. Like within the first like quarter to a half of the book, uh, we're done with most of the ocean turtle scenes. We only mainly cut out for a couple of scenes with um, Gabriel Miller talking to his hacker, whose name is Critter, I believe, um, and. Yeah, so that that's actually a really cool thing. I like the setup that Asuna is, within the next, I suppose, couple of books, going to enter the underworld to save Kirito. And the idea is that her love for him and the fact that he loves her, that's going to be the thing that sort of um, heals him in this state and kind of brings him back into the fight. And they'll t- both together be able to protect Alice from whatever is happening. Um so th- th- I, th- I thought that was a uh, pretty nicely done. There's also another really cool Asuna moment in that basically we start the ocean turtle scenes from, I think it's Higa's perspective and he's watching Asuna as she has basically Kikuoka pinned up against the wall. Like she, he's taller than her, but she's lifting him up by his collar and is like, has him slammed into a wall, like demanding that like, you will take the blame if Kirito doesn't recover from this. And he, as much as he's in this, actually in this really high position in the military and stuff like that, as they say, like he's a black belt and stuff like that, he's actually like terrified of like the Asuna's rage here in this moment. So that's going to be a very cool anime moment for for Asuna when they get to it. So you know, she she hasn't had a lot of scenes over the last couple of books, but it seems like it, we're finally getting into the situation where we'll have to come back to that. Um, so yeah, I, I'm excited to see how they do that. They seem to suggest that they're going to give her a somewhat high level account so it looks like it, anyone else who enters the game now is going to be entering it already leveled so that they'll be able to just immediately join the fight. Um, so that's that's interesting. Um, I suppose when I mentioned this it, it, it also is something that with Gabriel Miller that uh, he brings up Sinon a couple of times because of course he fought Sinon in at least one or two of the uh, Bullet of Bullet tournaments. And he notes that, like, he could tell from her that she is, like, really strong in VR. And actually, despite not knowing who she is, suspects that she might have been part of the SAO incident. Um, uh, which obviously isn't correct, but, like, it, it's close enough in that she knows people who's part of them. Um, and uh, the, and it, this kind of helps because, like, obviously, I, I think they more or less are heavily implying that Visago is, is a former SAO player. I don't think they're trying to say that Gabriel Miller is at all, um, but uh, we'll see that I think he, I think while Gabriel Miller begins to mention the SAO incident, that's going to be an interesting kind of point because he seems to sort of admire or want to fight people who are extremely into VR and Kirito obviously is the best example of that, but we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens. In terms of the present day story, uh, Alice jumps into being our main character because Kirito's out of action. So 
basically everything in the present day underworld is uh, from Alice's perspective. Uh, she is now looking after Kirito, who obviously she has to completely look after him. She has to feed him and all this sort of stuff because of the way he is. Like she, uh, she brings him back to Rulid Village initially. Um, there's some very emotional moments here as she obviously has to return to Rulid Village and Selka, of course, immediately like is happy that she's back and you know the sisters reunited. But her father immediately says that like you can't come back because you're a criminal. Um, so that was kind of tough because they they basically make the point over these episodes here. Alice begins to realize that the people that Kirito and Yujiro have encountered are are the people who are more willing to kind of break the taboo index. And this has been the entire theme of what's been going on here. The people who follow the taboo indexes uh, by the letter of the law are super strict in how they kind of handle everything. So her own father not being at all happy to have his daughter back just because she broke a, a taboo index law like it is a very telling point whereas Selka who actually has been influenced by um, Yuji and Kirito Kirito I suppose primarily here is the one who's more willing to be open to Alice and kind of uh, bring her straight back into the fold and um, similarly uh, Ronnie and TS are introduced towards the end here they're now part of the I suppose um the human army that's kind of uh, left in, in all of this to fight. Um, she notes the same thing about them, that normal girls like them would never come up to her as an integrity knight and ask to like give the swords back to their disciples or stuff like that. But because they were influenced by them, they did that. And so there's a level of extra freedom to them. So that's been what the entire arc has been about. It's been basically... Kirito awakening up so many different people as uh, an Alice AI, a bottom-up AI. Um, we we get introduced to a lot of the other Integrity Knights once again. Uh, Bercoli, since this is one, comes back into play because, of course, he is the person who trained Alice and she basically calls him uncle. Uh, we have uh, Synthesis 2, uh, Fanacio comes back into play. Eldry is actually like a, a secondary character now, Synthesis 31, who is the person who Alice trained. And what's interesting, we get a bit, the arc that we kind of get here is that because Alice is so focused on looking after Kirito, there's this sense that she sort of loses confidence in herself and her ability to actually be a fighter. And so when Eldry visits her, she refuses to kind of join the fight initially because she kind of feels that I have lost my ability to effectively use my sword and he's super disappointed by this and Eldry comes out more as a character here in that you can see how much he looks up to and respects Alice and how this Alice now that she's sort of awakened and is kind of struggling with the fact that she's not Alice like Z Z Zuberg um, she is Alice Synthesis 31 but she kind of is both of them but she's in this weird kind of transitional point in between both of them um, it's this arc basically about her accepting the fact that she is Alice but Alice as she is now is also an integrity knight and having to accept kind of those both aspects to herself and that this, uh, where she is right now she has to use the skills that she has to help save the world because that's exactly what Kirito and Yujiro would do if they were both here and she of course eventually joins the battle once again uh, you see a bunch of scenes over the course of this where she jumps back into action the big one is when Rulid Village is attacked in an initial attack from the Dark Territory and um, she is the one who has to save the village she takes up her sword once again because of that really emotional scene of she she's basically alerted to the fact that an attack has come in because Kirito, despite being gone, acts basically for the first time. He begins to move. He falls out of the bed that he's in and begins to crawl towards his sword. And she realizes that he's trying, despite his situation, to join the battle again and it's this wake-up call for her that even Kirito in his state is willing to do this. I have to do this again. And that's what eventually convinces her to you know, join up with the rest of the Integrity Knights to um, you know, face the Dark Territory. Because the, the entire kind of big plot point here is that the 
eastern gate is about to fail. Its durability is about to go down to zero. And this will be what eventually starts the fight between the Dark Territory and the like, human forces, basically. And this is the big war uh, in the underworld that's happening here. So huge plot point they basically say that it's got like over like 3 million health but it's down to like 2000 so they are days away and by the very end of the book we see the human forces coming up with their plan which is that their force of about like what is it like a thousand or something like that going up against a force of 50,000 and they're going to like drain all of the kind of magic within the area and Alice is going to be the one to do that so she is going to start the fight by basically draining all of the like magic energy within that area and launching an initial big fight uh, an initial big attack to start the fight so that's something we have to look forward to and um, just before that happens we get the emotional scene of I suppose Alice meeting Ronnie and TS again and I suppose the, the key thing here is of course uh, TS learning that Yu-Gi-Oh is dead in addition to I suppose Ronnie finding out that Kirito is basically in a coma uh, it's very emotional because obviously Alice has to like remember that these are the two girls that came up to her as she was taking Kirito and Yu-Gi-Oh away in the first place and afterwards they explain to Alice the the context behind what crime they actually committed and it kind of really doubles Alice down on the fact that she now has even more reason to fight like for Kirito and for everyone because um, the nobles were this kind of threat developing the background and uh, Kirito and Yu-Gi-Oh were even willing to fight that as well and um, so that that was really cool and, and what it does is like there's this constant almost like burden for Alice that she has to be the one she puts herself in charge of Yu uh, Kirito but when she meets TS and Ronnie they suddenly now are the ones who can look after Kirito so that's a pretty notable thing and um, that it kind of frees up Alice and she now has people who she can absolutely trust to look after Kirito um, I hope it means Ronnie and TS get some focus here. Like, they, she's Alice more or less says that they've like become warriors, but we we ha still haven't got a sense of like how strong they are, like what sort of stuff they can use. They they should sort of be these very interesting fighters in that they've learned from Kirito and Yu-Gi-Oh. So they should have this kind of unique kind of Einkrad style type thing. Um, so I, I hope we do get to see both of them fight at some point, even if it's just to use a little bit of uh, what they've learned. Um, but right now, the, the position that they're in is mainly just to keep Kirito safe uh, and allow Alice to fight as strong as she possibly can. Um, and I, I, I assume it's more or less setting up the fact that when Asuna arrives, like she will meet Kirito by finding Ronnie and TS or, or something like that. Um, some other fun interactions we get are actually Alice and Fenacio uh, interacting. Like Initially, there's this sense that the two sort of hate each other, but then through this sort of mut mutual connection they have through Kirito, they actually end up kind of bonding a little bit. So that's quite uh, notable, um, given that you know, Fenacio is like the, the second in command of the, the human army at this point. Um, in terms of the dark forces, the dark territory, I suppose this is the last kind of big talking point. Obviously, uh, Gabriel Miller is the Emperor Vecta. Uh, Vizago is a Dark Knight. And we, we basically get introduced to like the, te like the ten uh, generals of the Dark Territory. There's like two goblins, um, one Dark Mage, uh, an Orc, an Ogre, um, the Dark Knight uh, human leader who gets a bit of a focus. Um and I, I wasn't even counting there but you, you get the sense of basically these are the 10 generals kind of commanding the dark territory then all of a sudden their leader comes back and this sort of changes everything because basically what's go what goes on here there's also an assassin's guild as well there's a guy from the assassin's guild um what happens here is we begin to see a bit of infighting immediately because of the the return of vecta and what happens is that we focus in on the leader of the dark, the dark knights, um, and 
he they immediately established that he has he's basically he, there's a bit of a distraction like uh, some of the details here I'm just trying to remember them um, he's just about to ask his girlfriend to marry him uh, it, it's clear that they really really care for each other this is interrupted by the fact that Vecta has returned and um, throughout this sort of dialogue from him we get that he actually knows um, uh, Bercoli uh, his master has fought Bercoli I think they basically say his master before him fought Bercoli and also that he himself has fought Bercoli once and they basically say that the Dark Knights are just forever behind the Integrity Knights they just cannot stand up to him but that each battle along the way they're gradually progressing to get to the level of Integrity Knight. Uh, the, the Dark Elf Commander is named uh, Shasta. Um, and so you see that he's a kind of a more honourable character. Despite being part of the Dark Territory, he's this actually very honourable person. And what happens is that he he actually wants to make peace. The second the Dark Territory finds out that um, the Administrator has been killed... He is like the only one of the generals, the only one of the commanders of the Dark Territory who wants to make peace between the the Dark Territory and the Human Territory. Um, everyone else pretty much disagrees. And then when he meets Vecta for the first time, he realizes that Vecta doesn't want peace at all. He just wants carnage, chaos, basically. And he, he so his dream is not going to be fulfilled. So he basically rants to his you know, wife-to-be about this and what happens is that she secretly tries to assassinate Vecta but he immediately kills her and the big I suppose shocking the big central moment of all of this is that he asks all the generals to come over uh, and in front of him and just takes out this block of ice that has her head in it and immediately Shasta launches into an attack against Vecta and what we get here is this really interesting um, scene of him inadvertently using a weapon release. They basically say over the course of this that the Dark Knights have never been able to do the same abilities that the Integrity Knights have. They've always been behind. But his divine weapon is this like katana sword that has a slight mist effect to it, which he's managed to do. Which is his first level kind of weapon release command. Um, he's going to use this... But what happens is that the Assassin's Guild guy steps up and poisons him before this attack can work. So Shasta is dying here. Uh, Vecta doesn't even need to fight in this case. But as he's dying, he manages to awaken the final form of his sword. And he basically turns into this like spirit version connected to his weapon. Where the power of this mist, anything it touches is basically like devoured. It's like this kind of... Uh, poison mist that just kind of rips people apart so I think the two goblin generals are immediately killed um, w one other one as well is, is just immediately killed uh, yeah the, 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 the assassin guild guy is, is taken out straight away the dark elf leader this woman she loses her leg in, in all of this uh, but it's revealed that Gabriel Miller as Vecta is completely unaffected by this attack they explain that this attack specifically targets the Fluctlight itself. And it kind of works in reverse where the Fluctlight is attacked. And that eventually leads to damage actually happening to the person rather than the other way around. But it's revealed that it go, this attack goes straight through Gabriel Miller because... It's not just because of the technicality that he's diving into the world, he's actually a human. But that he has this sort of thing because of his personality and the person that he is... In a similar way to Kirito, he actually has this sort of like hole in his flucked light now. But in that case, it's because it's it's this kind of it's it's kind of hard to explain. It's like he doesn't get life in a way. Like he he doesn't care about life in terms of killing or even his own life. And so because of that, it has absolutely no effect. Whereas it affected the other people because as evil as they were, they still had this sense of wanting to hold on to their life. So that's why they were killed and. Uh, Vector wasn't so there's this sense of him feeling like he's immune to a lot of this stuff um, and I think I think in a previous chapter as well they also established that um, 
Vector cannot be chosen as the target of specific types of attacks. So he has this kind of built-in immunity as just being the, the Emperor as well. So I assume that's going to come into play at some point as well. Uh, that that feels very much like a kind of skill type thing like the administrator had. She couldn't be hurt by metal. So swords were immune to her except when, of course, the swords were made out of a different material. Um, and yeah, I think that's most of what I want to talk about here. I, I think for me, I, I really liked the focus that Alice got as a character. And even though Kirito, like as a character, didn't get too much of a chance to shine here... Just, I suppose, Alice's impression of him and how much she is inspired by him now. It it felt like, you know, now that we're sort of missing Kirito, her talking about him so much and what he kind of has helped so many people, it shows, you know, the strength of the character, what he brings to the show with everything that goes on. So I thought that was really interesting to see kind of uh, revealed in all of this. Um, but... Uh, with Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, the only other thing with Yu-Gi-Oh is that when T.S. Uh, finds out he dies, she touches the broken sword and it sort of glows temporarily and and it basically says to her, Yu-Gi-Oh's spirit in a way in the sword, you know, I'll always be with you. So there's this kind of, I suppose, hope for like if, if they find some way to sort of fix the Blue Rose sword that Yu-Gi-Oh may never come back normally. But there is some sense that, like, he could be, like, revived, like, as a entity within the sword or something like that. So, um, there's some hope there, even though, for the most part, we know Yu-Gi-Oh is gone. But at least, there's some sense that he's he's going to be in there. The fact that Yu-Gi-Oh is now gone obviously means there's this kind of clear path for, if Kirito wakes up again, he has two swords to use. And now, all of a sudden... It's his own sword that defines himself, plus the the sword of his best friend, um, and that is another reason that was. That's another thing that's going to make his sword all the more powerful because they basically say that the reason Kirito is in this state is because he blames himself for the death of Yujio, and it's going to take potentially an Asuna, but also maybe Alice, Ronnie, T.S. all together, you know, really helping him you know, get through the fact that he, you know, you don't need to blame yourself for this. So, uh, yeah, that's my review for Sword Art Online Allization Volume 15. I'm very intrigued to see how the anime does this. Um, there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done, uh, you know, to, to be shown here. And I think with the visuals, it's going to come across really, really well. I think already, if I remember correctly, the anime has shown some of this stuff. So they've already, I think, teased Subtilizer. So I suppose the idea is we've already got to see Gabriel Miller, even though um, they never drew attention to it. Like, we've already seen, basically, the people who will eventually become the main villains of the arc. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to wait a, a good bit in the anime to get there. Um, my assumption would be that the midway point of the anime, episode 26, is going to be the end of volume uh, 14. And probably episode 27 will be the start of this book. So uh, that's that. So uh, yeah, if you've read the book already, let me know what your thoughts are on volume 15. But uh, yeah, that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.